Hello and welcome to Promising Practice and Practices in California's Medicaid Transformation Initiative, made possible by the California Healthcare Foundation. Next slide. So first we'll start with a couple of housekeep housekeeping items. Uh, you may notice that your lines are muted, but we do want to hear from you. So please submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So today we're going to spotlight community partnerships and I'm so excited for the presenters. Today, we will have two Q&A sessions. So feel free to drop in your questions as they come to you. Next slide. So you will see these lovely faces today. You will have uh, two uh, California health plans uh, come on the line. So Cal Optima and Inland Empire Health Plan. We also have one community-based organization, American Family Housing. Um, it's so excited to spotlight all the promising practices that are coming out of California today. So you may be new to the Center for Healthcare Strategies. If so, welcome. We are a policy and implementation partner dedicated to improving uh, Medicaid. We do a lot of what you will see today, essentially uh, finding those best practices and elevating them for national and state specific audiences. Next slide. So here I'm gonna give, set the stage a bit. Why are we here today? And that's essentially because um, all across the nation, states are attempting to put Medicaid transformation on a managed care chassis. Most states have Medicaid managed care. I think it's above 40 states have Medicaid managed care now. And at the same time, state Medicaid agencies are continually thinking about the next stage of their Medicaid program. Uh, next five years, uh, Medicaid transformation, um, Medicaid reform, and a key goal for those transformation initiatives is to increase equitable access to whole person care. And by whole person care, we mean thinking about physical health, behavioral health, health-related social needs. So we had those two trends, Medicaid managed care, Medicaid transformation. To do this well, managed care plans will need to partner with community-based organizations, local government, and federally qualified health centers, among other community partners. It just needs to happen. And we're so excited to spotlight a very specific state initiative today. Next slide. So we will be talking about something called CalAIM, and that stands for California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal. It's brand new. It was launched in January 2022. And you may hear uh, a couple of new words for you. First, you will hear enhanced care management, ECM. And that's essentially care management for those with the most complex health and social needs. Individuals transitioning from incarceration, individuals experiencing homelessness, individuals with serious mental illness and substance use disorder. You'll also hear the word, word community supports. And uh, in prior iterations of these conversations and in other states, these are called in lieu of services. And essentially those in lieu of services are designed to address health related social needs. Some examples here, medically tailored meals, housing supports, asthma remediation, and again, both of these programs will require community partnerships and also building on partnerships from past iterations of Medicaid transformation initiatives in California. So you'll also hear perhaps whole person care pilots, health homes program. Those are past Medicaid transformation initiatives that the state is hoping to sustain 
um, those innovations statewide through Medicaid managed care on that managed care chassis. Next slide. So earlier this year, we uh, sat with um, several people in California and asked, how is it going? How is CalAIM happening? What are some issues that you're seeing? And what we heard is that new partnerships are necessary and they simply take time. Folks are building on what they already have, but these new partnerships um, will need to bloom and develop over time. We also heard that these partnerships may require new processes, new ways of doing things. And it's really important that with this policy change, with this drastic change, there needs to be payment models that support the real world needs of community partners. So essentially what we're doing today is really elevating those themes for you and seeing what it looks like um, from two California health plans. And with that, I am so happy uh, to uh, turn it to Melora Simon, and she will be providing some additional context from the California Healthcare Foundation. Thanks so much, Diana. It's great to be here today. Um, I'm the Associate Director for Advancing People-Centered Care at the California Healthcare Foundation. For those of you that don't know us, CHCF is an independent nonprofit foundation that works to improve healthcare for all Californians. We're especially focused on Californians with low incomes and others not well served by the current system. And because of that, we're focused on Medi-Cal and are watching CalAIM with interest because we think it represents an unprecedented opportunity to integrate care for people with complex needs and to enhance equity in the system. We've launched a resource center on CalAIM and also have a monthly roundup of resources and publications geared towards helping CalAIM's implementers make the most of the opportunities presented by this transformation. You can always get to it at chcf.org slash CalAIM, and uh, the links are also in the chat. To build briefly on what Diana said, CalAIM's success depends on new cross-sector partnerships to deliver on its vision of whole person care. This would be true in any state trying to address social needs through Medicaid, but it's especially true in California, where Medicaid's coverage of essential services is divided up between plans and counties. And the managed care chassis that she described is completely foreign to many of these new partners. From what we've heard, the first several months of CalAIM transformation and implementation have demonstrated just how foreign it is and how big the need for translation is. So in constructing this webinar, we really wanted to focus in on what was working for providers that are new to managed care. You'll be hearing from plans, but through the lens of what providers said was working well. So without further ado, I'll hand it back to Diana, who will introduce our panelists. Well, I am so excited to move on to the next panelist. And essentially, uh, we have Kelly Bruno Nelson uh, with Cal Optima. You may know her uh, from her past life as well uh, with the National Health Foundation. And there she helped um, build medical respite programs. With that, um, happy to uh, have the state turn over the stage and um, welcome Kelly Bruno Nelson. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. And it is very interesting to be here with a different hat on. Um, definitely used to being the provider in these spaces and now find myself playing for the other team. So I do want to give a big shout out to Cal Optima Health for actually. Um, bringing on folks like myself onto their team because they recognize the importance of the bridge between our providers and our health plan when it comes to making Cal AIM work. Um, they're different entities, right? I mean, a health plan is a, is, is a great thing and our nonprofits are also great things. And while they're both doing uh, work in the community, oftentimes they, they don't see things the exact same way. So what better way to, uh, to bridge that gap than to bring folks on like myself who really understand what it means to be a provider in the community. So I give a big shout out to Cal Optima Health for doing that. So I'm excited today to share with you some of the insights that we have gotten from our, uh, our provider uh, partners and how we have been attempting to make some changes here at Cal Optima Health to address what we have, have learned from them. Um, next slide, please. 
So just very, very briefly, Cal Optima Health is our mission is to serve member health with excellence and dignity. We were founded as Orange County's community health plan for low-income families here in Orange County. We are the only Medi-Cal health plan here in Orange County. We serve about 950,000 members, which is about one in four adults and one in three children in the county. And I think equally as impressive as we employ uh, 1,500 employees and have about a $4 billion budget. So we have a tremendous impact and reach here in Orange County. Next slide, please. So what did we, what did we learn? So I, I will start by saying, as I said before, and I'll say it again, our ability to implement CalAIM is completely dependent on the providers who provide the care. We don't provide the care, the partners do. And so our ability to work with them and make their jobs easy is how we best serve our members. So I kind of divided my presentation into three sections and saying, kind of grouping it into what our providers have told us. And the first thing they said is, you know, managed health plans are complicated. And I will be the first to say that they are absolutely correct. I have been at Cal Optima Health now for almost six months and I'm still discovering departments that I did not even know we had. Um, it is a big complex bureaucracy, not necessarily, un not, not unnecessarily, but just different. And so it is complicated for our community-based organizations to have to work through. So we did a couple of things that hopefully are making their lives easy. First off is that we've done some presumptive eligibility for some of our community supports. I should also back up and say that Cal Optima Health has implemented by the end of this year, we'll have implemented all 14 of the community supports. And we're one of the few health plans in California that have done that. So we've done a lot of work with partners um, in the community. And what we wanted to do is to see how many of these supports could we actually just automatically approve. And so for example, for recuperative care, all of, our, all of our members that need recuperative care, the first 14 days are automatically approved. And that makes life easier for our providers because then they don't have to worry about somebody not getting paid for those first few days while they're waiting for the authorization to be approved. They know that no matter what, those first 14 days are going to be approved. Clearly we did the same thing with our sobering centers and we have a couple of other ones that are in the, in the, the pipeline as well. Starting in January of 2023, we're also going to be uh, implementing auto authorizations for several of our supports. So we are able to look at which of our supports are we just approving anyway? Like navigation, for example, of the folks that are getting navigation, I think we have a 98% um, approval rate. So why can't we just auto authorize um, navigation? Same thing for, um, for housing deposits. Uh, and there's several others. So when it comes to in January, we're very happy to tell our providers that several of our supports will be auto authorized, which makes their lives easier, our lives easier, and then of course gets care to our members even more quickly. Another thing that we did was we um, implemented a new position called community support liaisons. And these are basically care managers or case managers for our community supports. So no longer will a community support provider have to talk to billing if they have an issue with their billing or authorizations if they have an issue there. Or if, if, if our system is not working, they have to talk to IT. They don't have to do that anymore. They have one person and that, that is their person. And they have a standing regular meeting with that person so that they have time on the books to be able to ask them whatever questions that they have. And we're already seeing a huge um, impact here, not only in our ability to provide services, but the trust associated and the trust being built between us and our providers. Next slide, please. Another thing that we heard is our communities are diverse and that you need to recognize that um, Cal Optima Health and not think that a one size fits all is the best approach. And so that told us that we needed to do two things. We needed to expand our network, not only just geographically to make sure we had providers represented in the South County, the, you know, the Mid County and the North County, but that we also were, were expanding ourselves to different types of providers, providers that, were, that specifically serve the LGBTQIA plus community or our Tay community, or our providers that, that had a preference in, in, certain, um, in, in, in certain cultural communities. We need to make sure that the providers we have represent the members that we serve. And so there has been a big effort to expand to not only the larger nonprofits in our, in our community, but also the smaller grassroots nonprofits so that we can make sure that we are reaching all of our members. We're also told that uh, health plans like words, 
we like a lot of words and, and most of our materials have a lot of them and they're absolutely right. So we've recreated um, all of our materials for our members and made it much easier to understand less words, more pictures, just, just more friendly face than just the, the very overworded kind of things that we have a tendency to wanna do. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, our nonprofits told us, you know, our services are not only valuable, but they're also unique and that it's important for us to, rec to recognize that um, not every nonprofit is the same and they're, they're different. And, and that is that is a good quality, not a bad quality. And so um, and also there are very sophisticated enterprises um, just because they may operate differently than us doesn't make them less sophisticated than who we are. So we needed to recognize that. And so Cal Optima Health was very proud to take every one of our community supports and have, make sure that our rates were at the top of all of the ranges recommended by DHCS. So we immediately increased that across the board to ensure that we're showing our nonprofit partners that we value the services that we, they provide. We also asked them to make sure that not only were they doing outreach to members that may not be connected to their nonprofits, but that also we allow them to do in reach, meaning that we said, you're already providing some of these services to your members. And if they're your members and there are members, then we should be compensating for you for what you're already doing. So we've asked them to both do outreach and in reach so that we could ensure that they're reaching as many of our members as possible. And quite frankly, that we are infusing the dollars into their nonprofits necessary for them to build the infrastructure to do that. So some of our nonprofit partners that we partner with, we knew partnering with them that they did not have the capacity to increase their ability to serve more members, but that was okay with us because we wanted to be able to partner with them to provide the services to the members they were already serving. So this is a little bit of a different approach. And it was something that we heard from our partners when they said, we're already serving your members, we should be partners already. And then finally, we did some relaxing of some contracting requirements. And I'm expecting and anticipating that as our partnership with our nonprofits continue, that we'll find more opportunities to do this. One example of this is our insurance requirements. As a health plan, we had particular insurance thresholds that, um, that we had in place that kind of worked for us through the years. And again, we used a one size fits all, but those insurance thresholds were not necessarily appropriate for a small community-based organization. They were more appropriate for a, a physician's office or, or a chiropractor or something of that nature. And so we needed to look at these uh, insurance requirements and say, are we expecting too much of our small community-based organizations? And so with their help, we identified lower uh, uh, insurance thresholds that we were told would be good. And we got our board to approve that and our board approved that. So we're able to reduce our insurance thresholds and immediately see, I think it was something like 12 community partners immediately be eligible to partner with us that weren't eligible before because the insurance thresholds were just too high. I love telling that story because I think it's an example of us listening very closely to what our partners told us. And I'm expecting and anticipating that as our partnerships and, and relationships continue to build, that we will find more opportunities like this. Thank you. So Milo, uh, Milo Pineman from the uh, American Family Housing Organization, a partner of Cal Optima, uh, take the stage. Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, uh, Kelly. Uh, hi, I'm Milo Pineman. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of American Family Housing. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization uh, that provides housing and services to homeless and low-income family, uh, families and adults. We build and acquire housing, about 200 new units per year, and we're uniquely qualified in our space to operate both housing and housing services together. We have property management in-house. We have in-house supportive services. We definitely take a whole person approach to what we do. Give you a sense of our size, we have about 90 employees uh, and we are an early adopter of the Cal and Community Supports Program in Orange County in partnership with, with Caltima Health. Uh, having rolled off a whole person care pilot previously, I also happen to have a lot of experience in the veterans healthcare space working with the VA and working with housing uh, thousands of homeless veterans. So it's a, a landscape that's, that's parallel but familiar. 
And we've really shifted to my five years at the agency on focusing integrating health into housing within the framework of viewing housing as a key determinant of health for who we serve. Um, I'd say in Orange County, we work with somewhere between five and 50% of all homeless or recently homeless households in the county. Uh, we've enrolled more than 400 people, uh, individuals this year in Calain, uh, community supports. Uh, by the end of the year, we'll have about 600, where maybe 150 will be in you know, short-term bridge or shelters, not really housed, but, but out, off the streets. And the rest will be uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, in housing. And there's a, nearly a complete overlap between who is covered by the rollout of Cal and community supports under California Health and the homeless population that we serve. Um, you know, and since, since my agency serves mostly very high acuity households, there's actually a lot of uh, high utilization uh, uh, of the healthcare system that we're seeing too. Um, just to kind of tell you a bit more about us, I mean, in practice, my, my nonprofit business model for any homelessness, and I, it's industry standard, it's evidence-based, uh, is we, we identify who to serve through, through collaborations with other nonprofits and our agency partners. We get people into housing, and then we support them with wraparound services. Uh, I described it as a three-legged stool that we kind of sit on. You know, one leg is the housing, which is very hard to find in Southern California. One leg is rent subsidies to pay the bills for the housing. And the third is funding for services, you know, most of which would, do, would qualify for community supports. And it's almost impossible to align those together. It's very, very difficult. You get folks who have one but not the others. And it makes it very, very challenging to do this work. And in that context, one thing we don't have is sophisticated billing staff for the type of billing that you might see in the healthcare system. We, ought, we have actually have sophisticated staff, but they operate the housing where we live, we build units from scratch. We buy the land, build it, develop it, you know, operate it. Uh, we also um, uh, work with collecting rents and all those different fair housing laws and so forth. It's a very, very complicated world. And my time goes to making sure that the elected officials are supported, that I need to sit on some of the commissions, perhaps a planning commission, to make sure that we have the will for this kind of local activity. So to give you an example, this month, the last, this last three weeks, we've had three buildings open, two ribbon cuttings uh, with them. And that's all of our bandwidth uh, for a lot of our team members, uh, uh, quite, a, quite a mobilization for a 90 person agency. So in that context, you know, historically services funding has been lacking, very lacking. And when what little there is, it's very competitive. Uh, and the funding there is really, really hard just to keep the lights on uh, because you could easily lose funding to technical errors. So I guess I took the time to describe it to really speak to how much what a big deal it is to have this rollout of the community supports that California Health is doing so very well, uh, where, where uh, it's, it's more of an over-the-counter approach and not, not competitive in that way. It's about qualifying. Uh, um, and it's really significant that California has kept it simple. Um, I, I think the, the opportunity to have non-competitive approaches that, to accessing resources that we could scale up and are simpler for smaller nonprofits, but even ones like mine, which, which still struggle, which we struggle, is huge. So I think the simple billing, I think this authorization process uh, uh, is, is great. I think, I, I love the, the comments uh, and thoughts about how to make it simpler for us. So more smaller nonprofits can join uh, in, in this. This frees us up to focus on, on the customer, the end user, instead of managing our, our agency funders. Um, you know, I would just, I would just uh, kind of close by just saying, I think this is a transformative moment potentially to be, to be connecting these Calain uh, resources uh, with Caltima Health with our, with our housing resources. We, we, we get dead ends all the time. We have someone who has a housing rental subsidy, but we don't have a way to staff with work staff with them. We get a housing unit, but no way to support them. This is, this is quite a, an opportunity. And uh, particularly around uh, um, uh, in this healthcare space, uh, it's a whole different world to be talking about working with people with healthcare data and healthcare resources. It's a great chance for equity in the work we do and going deeper into more communities and more locally. So I guess I'll pause there and just say thanks for the chance to talk about what we're doing. Thank you so much. And Kelly, join the conversation again. Let's see your beautiful face. Awesome. So we have a, a couple questions in the Q&A. Um, and one of them uh, is about essentially state guidance. Um, and uh, there's someone uh, on the line that's uh, not from California, but uh, certainly thinking about in lieu of services in their state and in lieu of services um, is essentially uh, community supports in California, providing that translation. How did uh, the state support you in, in your efforts and your flexibility in implementing um, CalAIM? 
So I'm still learning this. I want to put that out and to, and say that you know the state puts out guidelines, but they're they, they are in they are guidelines, and uh, and we have the ability to really work within those guidelines. Now I can speak for my health plan and say that you know we as Milo so eloquently said, you know we put the member at the center of everything we do. And so as we're looking at those guidelines and trying to figure out how best to serve our members, it's in, this, in that spirit that we do make adjustments. So they have been, you know, we have to put in our models of care and we put those things into our models of care. And so far we have found um, a lot of support and actually I would say encouragement from DHCS and the way in which we are interpreting, interpreting things. Um, so we have not had any problems. I mean, you know, also the health plans are the ones that are shouldering the cost here, of course, because the concept here is that we will save money by the fact that we're providing for social determinants of health, that ultimately healthcare will cost less. So, um, you know, Cal Optima Health is taking the approach of, you know, everybody in the game here, and we're going to go full fledged, but we have not found, we, in fact, I would say we have found DHCS to be very understanding and flexible with anything that we've suggested. Wonderful. So California, like many other states, have um, underscored the importance of health equity. How do you partner and engage with the diverse communities you serve and ensure that more people can receive culturally congruent care? And I think this aligns with a lot of the questions in the Q&A box currently on you know, essentially do you employ community health workers? Uh, what sort of care managers do you use? Um, shed some light on that uh, for both organizations. Sure. sure. Uh, so, I mean, think, uh, we're, we're a local nonprofit. We operate in Orange County, LA County. So we have staff who speak languages in the communities we operate. We have staff who know the name of all the, the homeless, the, the years long folks, the folks been homeless for years on, by the Huntington Beach Pier, by City Hall in Pasadena. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we have offices in Little Saigon, so we have uh, Vietnamese uh, fluent staff. Uh, and so we're, we're on the ground and grassroots, and by that nature, we kind of focus on that kind of cultural competency. And I think one of the most painful things that we come across as we're trying to put our resources to the best use is, is when we get referrals and that we can't work with, but yet we know they would qualify for programs. And I think, I think there's, there's a real uh, opportunity here for equity when, you, when we get some of the people who call us and say, well, can you work with us? Uh, and we have to try and figure out how to get them into this aligning of resources I talked about. And to be able to, if they're eligible for CalAIM, to get them into navigation services and work with them and start to kind of walk them through how to access resources to, to get into a, a situation where, where they can address their healthcare needs uh, is, is a huge shift for us. And it's, it's, a, it's quite a large, uh, a large difference. And I, we're just starting to now see how impactful that can be. Um, thank you. Kelly, do you want to provide additional context? Sure. I mean, I talked a little bit about that when I talked about diversifying our, our community, you know, our, our providers. And I, and I really will probably latch on to that as my answer. You know, as the only Medi-Cal health plan in Orange County, we can reach all of our members, you know, one of two ways. We can go top down and do these, you know, big analysis and these analytics and try to figure out where they are and go locate them. Or we could quite easily, more easily, just partner with every community-based organization out there that's already providing the services. And we're really looking at it from that perspective. Um, we have to we have to diversify who we're partnering with, and make sure that we have the resources available and the tech and the technical assistance available to bring in those smaller grassroots organizations that are really providing, oftentimes, to those smaller cultural communities, healthcare is local, right? Very, those smaller communities, like I said, maybe the Tay community, maybe families. Our, 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 our strength is the number of providers that we have. And so that's really the approach that we've been taking to ensure that we can make that happen. There, there's a lot of nonprofits that would like to step up and be more involved this way and like to expand their capacity. And they're really limited because it takes so much bandwidth to, to structure your funding, to make it work, to liaise with, with agencies, uh, uh, to liaise with the California Health Board itself it could be a, a full-time job for one person if that's the process. So this is quite a large deal for being able to go from a, a few larger nonprofits that really have built up over decades the capacity to do this work to many more and more local nonprofits who might be more specialized like, and that's an example, uh, uh, Tay and other, and other organizations.
So we have a question in the chat about the role of uh, medical legal partnerships. Um, this may, um, may or may not be known to you, but certainly uh, very influential in housing services and wondering if there are any partnerships that you would like to um, elevate there. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a leap. <laughs> so uh, for my final question, um, I would like to know where you want to go. How do you hope to scale and build this partnership over time? And then we'll go on to the next session and, and talk a little bit more about payment models. Milo, I'll let you go first. I'll go first. Uh, well, uh, listen, we 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 can we want to we 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 can serve many many more people if we can link the county community supports to the housing resources we have. We have 400 units of housing coming on online between October 1st and next June, and we could enroll, I say, solidly 80% of them in Calame, and that frees up a lot of a lot of our time and energy to focus on training and capacity. But ultimately, sustainability, just to have these be sustainable, we're always hopping from rock to rock to cross the stream to stay in business in our world. It's very difficult and high risk, which means you don't grow. You stay small because it's too risky. This will allow a lot of nonprofits who don't have millions in the bank or cushion to actually grow and just focus on implementation. You know, and I think I think one thing that I've heard talked about, which I think is exciting, is the chance to support uh, capacity building, you know, being pushed to the to the, the, the providers in terms of training. You know, I think it's very expensive and time consuming to get training on a lot of these 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 practices. And so when you spend all your time chasing funding and not training, you know, you can see how that limits what a, a small local nonprofit that's specialized can do. But those are the ones who really are dialed into the local need in many communities. And those are the folks who are going into the hospitals and ER on a regular basis, but that linkage isn't, isn't being made. So I, th I think uh, the, the chance to have uh, training and capacity building coming from, from, from that level to the different providers and really just bringing everyone's game up to a different level, I think is, is, is super exciting. So what do I see for the future? How do I see if we're going to build this? Uh, I think I say all the time, and I believe it, we're going to break the system, OK? And, and, and we have to feel comfortable breaking the system. And as a health plan, that's not how health plans are. Um, that's not how we're, how we're wired. We're wired to make sure everything is exactly perfect, that nothing is going to go wrong, and then take the first step. These are social supports, okay? They're not medical supports. And while I, I would like that to be absolutely perfect if someone's gonna open my brain and have brain surgery, right? When we're talking about social supports, there's a lot more flexibility. Different providers do things different ways. Different people need things done different ways. And so as a provider, as a, as a healthcare provider, we need to feel comfortable going into spaces that we don't necessarily have all the answers to. We need to feel comfortable breaking the system. And I think that is okay. So I see us, the future for us is to continue to learn from our partners, to make sure that we are completely and totally accessible and that we have all the voices at the table. One thing we have not done here at Cal Optima Health that I really want us to be able to do is we need to hear the, the voice louder of our members. And I don't think our unhoused members play a role in what we do. I don't think our, our justice involved members play a role in what we do. And that's a huge mistake. And so we need to do something to make sure that they're in the fold as well. Yeah, I want to add one more thought on that future because I've come across something during uh, the last couple of years, which is that we work with a lot of people referred in through the whole person care pilot or through the healthcare networks. Uh, I guess that would be the outreach versus the inreach, uh, as, as Kelly framed it. And then we also are working with, with folks in our own buildings are coming in referred through housing. And there's a pretty significant lack of overlap between this whole homeless systems infrastructure that's, that's in place and the healthcare systems and so forth. And just by having this funding and these conversations in place, we are seeing alignment being driven because it just makes sense. So that means uh, we have the same customers, they're all the same people, the same target population. And it's it's kind of surprising when I look at the two systems and no one knows, the other names don't exist in the other one. This is transformed in many, many ways. Uh, and especially as we look at trying to target high high volume utilizers, you know, one of our we we were, we focus a lot of, of on high volume utilizers in our time. We had one person who was hospitalized seventy eight times. You have a building leasing up where you have to have at least a couple of emergency visits in the last year or hospitalization to meet that threshold. 
And to have those folks aligning with the housing resources is a really, uh, is, it's, 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 it's a powerful shift in how we're sharing information. And it's really about just putting the customer first and not us and our systems. I think this is, this is a truly exciting time. It, it, I, the sky's the limit if we just keep moving. It's my honest opinion. Well, some wonderful closing thoughts and we'll see you all again. So keep the questions coming um, if you have additional follow-up questions uh, for this great group. Um, with that, I want to focus in on payment models. And I see a couple questions in the chat about payment. So you just heard about community supports. Community supports are optional services for plans to provide. So each plan is electing them. Uh, the state has um, suggested some uh, pricing guidance for those services. And so um, when you heard Kelly talking about essentially going to the top of that pricing range, that's what she's uh, doing here. For enhanced care management, um, there's less guidance from the state. Um, and when, something that's notable about the next presenter is that when we were having these interviews, you know, folks were getting used to changes, but this payment model was something that one provider really noted as uh, something that enabled their work and made sure that um, they could scale and um, help with CalAIM. And so with that, I want to turn the stage over to Dr. Wada. Um, and Matthew Ray with the Inland Empire Health Plan. Great, thank you, Diana. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, Cal Optima. You have some great programs. I think I just heard you present at the uh, California Association of Health Plans Conference, and you're doing some great work over there. So really appreciate uh, having you um, and uh, getting a chance for us to talk about enhanced care management and how we've used our sort of payment model to drive outcomes. Um, IEHP, Inland Empire Health Plan, um, is uh, the Medi-Cal administrator for the program for San Bernardino County and Riverside counties, two of the largest counties in the United States. I think San, San Bernardino County is the largest and Riverside, I believe, is 26 in terms of geography. We um, have about uh, 1.5 million Medi-Cal lives uh, that we support. Um, so I'm going to start off the presentation, and then I'll turn it over to my co-presenter, uh, Matt Ray, who's our Director of Health Services Special Initiatives. Uh, next slide. Um, so I, I don't think this is going to be new to uh, any of you in the health plan world. Um, or if you're a NCQA, but um, this is sort of the, the, the pyramid of care coordination continuum, care management court continuum. Um, at the bottom, we have sort of basic population health management. So this is around engagement, around prevention and wellness for our low risk members. Um, and of course, we look at member data and try to risk stratify and do segmentation using all types of data, including social drivers of health data when we can get it, um, you know, geographic data, utilization data. Um, next up is sort of complex care management. So this is for members that uh, sort of write what's called rising risk or medium risk. They need some ongoing care coordination, some intervention for temporary needs, transportation, disease management. And then what we're going to talk about today is really around enhanced care management, which is a new benefit under Medi-Cal that started this year. Um, this is for our highest needs members. Um, the populations of focus, as Diana mentioned, that went live this year are uh, for the homeless, members experiencing homelessness, um, those with severe mental illness, as well as um, the high utilizers. And there's some definitional criteria around that. Um, next year, in 2023, there will be some additional populations of focus that go live for this benefit. That will include um, individuals transitioning from long-term care or trying to keep them from going into long-term care. In mid-2023, there will be a complex children, a new benefit for enhanced care management. And I know the state is um, exploring, uh, towards the end of 23 or 24, another population of focus around pregnant women experiencing disparities. So we all know that there are a lot of disparity gaps with our African-American maternal outcomes. So we're looking forward to that. 
And then uh, along the right-hand side, there's transitional care services. So as we all know, there's often gaps where people fall through the cracks whenever they're experiencing a transition of care. So really enhanced care management sitting at the top of sort of that pyramid is responsible for all of these things um, in, in our model. So they are, you know, whether someone has multiple complex illnesses, physical or behavioral health, they still need basic population health. They need their screenings, they need their immunizations, um, they need transitions of care work. And so that enhanced care management team is really setting, sitting at the top and working again with some of our most complex members. Um, one thing that uh, I would definitely like to point out is that um, with enhanced care management and with our uh, two counties being so geographically large, you know, partnerships are absolutely essential. We do as a health plan some uh, direct services, as we'll talk about in a, in a moment, but uh, we could not do it without partnerships. So really leveraging our primary care providers, our community-based organizations, our county government uh, partners is, is absolutely critical um, in the work that we do. Um, next slide. So for us, um, our enhanced care management teams are composed of uh, a nurse care manager, an RN, a behavioral health uh, care manager, a care coordinator, and a community health worker. And prior to Cal Abe and Enhanced Care Management, California had a program called the Health Home Program, and the counties had a program called Whole Person Care. And uh, learning from those two programs, they were both doing some similar type work, working with high utilizing populations, high risk populations, trying to do um, sort of this wraparound community based care management. Um, so taking learnings from that really kind of informed the development of enhanced care management. We were one of the early programs that started with health homes, and we had some great success with that uh, in terms of moving some of our HEDIS clinical outcomes. So we really wanted to maintain fidelity to that model. And so I know um, a lot of different health plans are using different models for their care teams but we've really tried to stick with this four person team. It is, it is a robust team, but we really feel that given the complexity of these populations, it is the most effective in terms of determining outcomes. Um, and with that, and with the partnerships that we have, a lot of our health home providers actually uh, transitioned over into becoming enhanced care management partners. And so they did have to change some of their models of care slightly, but because they had already been working with us, they already had built relationships with us. Um, they had already done uh, combined trainings with us It made that transition a lot easier. And the network then of enhanced care management teams um, was more mature. So as we thought about how we were going to build the uh, reimbursement model, both for health homes and for enhanced care management, we really felt that we could um, really push the needle a little bit on, on value-based payment to try to drive outcomes. Now we did absolutely listen to them as well, which I think uh, was, was mentioned uh, in the prior presentation, listening to our partners is absolutely critical. And so one of the things that they brought forward was when you're, you know, if you're, if we're being paid on a per PMPM per member per month basis, you know, it, it takes a long time to engage these very complex members, particularly those with severe mental illness. You're going to be doing a lot. We're doing a lot of outreach attempts, and, and sometimes they're, they're not successful, or it's going to take us 15 or 30 attempts to build that trust before someone finally accepts to uh, join the program. And we're not being compensated for that. And so it, as we thought about our compensation model, we built in um, a payment for outreach attempts. Uh, so that would be one example. For new ECM providers coming on board, and, and I'll turn it over to Matt in a minute who can give more detail on this. You know, they're building up their caseload, their things up front that they have to do in terms of uh, development and implementing the IT platform that we require teams to use. And so we had to give them ramp up funding before they could sustain uh, their, their models of care with the, with the PMPM billings. And then on top of that, we have the value-based component. So for IEHP, we have sort of three provider model types. We have uh, what we call model one. So these are generally 
enhanced care management teams that are housed with the primary care providers. And we found that to be the most effective uh, for care coordination because they're with the provider. And that's really what we're talking about uh, for today. Model two teams are health plan based teams. Uh, this is where we use our own health plan staff in some of our rural geographic areas where there just are no providers and no community based organizations that have capacity or the case load volume to do that. And then we're looking at a model three, which is some specialty care unique teams. We are considering being a little bit more flexible with the um, team composition model to try to get more um, partners involved, but uh, those would be falling into the model three. And again, we do require um, all these teams to use a common platform so that we can get the data we need and it's tied into the, the billing uh, and our reporting. And so uh, again, we use uh, community health workers. I know that was one of the questions uh, in the prior. In California, community health workers are a benefit, but if they're part and billing through ECM, uh, they're reimbursed through the PMPM model. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Matt. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Wada, and uh, thanks, Diana, for uh, giving us an opportunity to uh, shed some light on uh, IEHP's uh, ECM program and payment models. Uh, so again, I'm Matt Ray. I'm the Director of Health Services Special Initiatives here at IEHP, and I work alongside Dr. Wada in uh, implementing and overseeing uh, the ECM benefit here at the plan. The slide you're looking at right here is IEHP's ECM provider payment structure. Uh, as you can see, there are really four payment streams or pathways for which providers can earn dollars. Uh, the first, as you'll see, is by engaging and enrolling the member. Enrolled members who are seen on a regular frequency are captured in a per-engaged member per month payment, also known as a capitated payment. And this, again, <clears throat> is a payment for providing ongoing enhanced care management services to the enrolled member. The second, as you see there, is value-based. And uh, this is really what we're excited about. It's a payment uh, type that's based on the ECM provider's individual performance with respect to pre-selected quality and outcome-based measures. And we'll see a little bit more of that in detail in a moment. Uh, the third payment there is for outreach, as Dr. Wada had just mentioned, and I'll get into more detail also on this in a moment. But this payment, again, is largely based on outreach efforts that the ECM providers uh, engage with members who are not yet enrolled in the ECM benefit. And really, this is IHP saying that we are recognizing that in most cases with this complex population, it takes significant amount of time and effort and resources to engage and get members to enroll into the program. And so with that, uh, IEHP uh, reimburses ECM providers for outreach attempts, successful or unsuccessful, uh, on a fee-for-service basis. And uh, as you can see here, the last payment stream is incentive-based. So uh, IEHP is participating in another CalAIM incentive program called the Incentive Payment Program, IPP. And uh, the plan earns dollars for meeting certain measures created by the state. And IEHP in turn passes those dollars through to its ECM and community support provider network really to help support the overarching goals of IPP, namely delivery system infrastructure and uh, provider capacity building. So with that, IEHP has created a set of milestones for ECM providers to achieve in the first year of ECM. Uh, providers can earn dollars by achieving these milestones <clears throat> that relate to the success of ECM. And as you can see, some of those are which are related to the transition from the health homes program and whole person care programs for increasing enrollment, for using the common care management platform provided by IEHP that Dr. Wada mentioned, for hiring community health workers, and, and so on. Uh, next slide. So as previously mentioned, uh, this slide summarizes IHP's ECM value-based payment measures. Uh, and as you can see here, there are six measures. Uh, and for context, IHP rolled out the VBP component during the last of the three years of the Health Homes Program in 2021. So 2022 is technically the second year IHP has been engaged with VBP. And I won't read the descriptions of each measure, but certainly if the slides are distributed, you can take a look 
in more depth at that time of the measure description. But essentially the way it works is, is IHB created a quote unquote levels of achievement for each measure, as you see there on the right hand side. And although they're not defined here, uh, within the contracts of our ECM providers are defined goals or thresholds within each level. So for example, level, level one can be seen as really the easier or easiest level of achievement with uh, the least amount of a provider's caseload having to meet that threshold. And then levels two and three become progressively more challenging and require a higher percentage of a provider's caseload to meet the goal or threshold. Uh, the higher the level achieved, as you can see, the more dollars a provider can earn, which is on top of their base uh, capitated rate for enrollment and engagement, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we are considering adding a diabetes measure to the VVP measure set that you see here in 2023. But really overall, um, IEHP has received a lot of positive feedback from its network with respect to integrating this VVP component into ECM. Uh, next slide. All right, so as Dr. Wada had mentioned earlier, um, we do provide a lot of support uh, in terms of bringing on new providers uh, to our network for ECM. We know there's a lot that we ask of them um, to be an ECM provider. We know there's a lot of regulations and um, with the four person care team that Dr. Wada had mentioned that we prescribe and require that our ECM providers employ, we do provide ramp up funding and really uh, this provides new ECM providers funding to assist with the launch of ECM implement implementation, and really it's generally seen to offset the cost of hiring the ECM care team, the RN, the behavioral health care manager, the care coordinator, and the CHW. And so for a period of six months, we help to financially support an ECM provider to do that, and we've created a set of benchmarks or milestones for each month to really help make sure that that provider is successful when they come on board with IVHP, so that when that ramp up funding ends at the end of the six months and they transition over to the capitated base rate model, that they're aligned and set up to financially sustain uh, their care team and the success of the program. Over on the right hand side, just a little bit more about outreach. Um, we uh, historically have not reimbursed for outreach to the health homes program, but we're really happy to integrate that into our payment model for ECM. Again, we uh, reimburse providers on a fee for service basis for successful or unsuccessful attempts, up to 15 reimbursable attempts per member per calendar year. Uh, we certainly recognize a significant amount of time and effort goes into getting members educated about the benefit and, and what it can really do for them. So uh, we've been really pleased to integrate that into our payment model. A couple other things that we've integrated uh, earlier this year were incentive-based payments, as I mentioned earlier. We, we recently um, uh, announced to our network some uh, bonus payments that we'd be awarding to pay providers for enrolling more uh, members into the program by um, certain time frames. And certainly, uh, we know that enrollment continues to be a challenge as a provider's caseload continues to reach a certain point. And so, um, we really are encouraging and incentivizing uh, our providers to um, really ramp up their outreach uh, efforts and strategies so that we can get more of our vulnerable members into uh, the benefit. Uh, last slide. All right. So um, although it may be a little bit small to see or read, this last slide shows a visual representation on our internal Power BI application of uh, the performance across all value-based payment measures across all ECM providers. So this shows at an aggregate level, the performance of our ECM provider network through roughly the first three quarters of ECM. And uh, as you can see, there's been quite some demonstrated improvement across all measures in the early going. And uh, we certainly hope to keep that momentum going as we close out this first year. Uh, IHP continually evaluates individual ECM provider performance uh, and aggregate level performance and annually adjust the achievement thresholds 
uh, as necessary. Uh, and I'd say that IEHP has been very happy to integrate, again, this value-based component into a DCM program and really continues to look at ways of raising the bar and the expectations of our providers so that our, our really our most vulnerable members uh, receive the care uh, that they deserve. So with that, Diane, I think that's the last slide. So I'll pause there. Awesome. So a, a couple of things I want to amplify that outreach payment was seen as, you know, sort of a game changer. And that's what we heard from our interviews. Um, often a pain point in uh, ECM uh, payment models. So want to elevate that for everyone on the call today. And of course, the importance of that ramp up funding. So I'm going to ask all the, the beautiful faces to come back on, on the line. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of time just quite yet, but I want to ask, uh, essentially, what advice would you give uh, to plans uh, moving in this space? And Dr. Wada, I want to start with you because um, I want to add a little spin for this in particular because you noted that you essentially had to shift your model for the rural communities that you serve. Um, so if you could uh, throw in that uh, additional detail, that would be lovely. Uh, sure, we, we are looking for opportunities to get as many providers involved in the ECM program as we can, as well as you know, have this benefit for as many members as we can, given the good outcomes that we're experiencing. So um, the four-person model is, is tough. I, I think we all experience staffing challenges, especially during COVID. We had a lot of providers that just couldn't maintain the staffing. Um, and so we have to balance sort of what we see as essential staff to drive outcomes um, versus the realities of some of the challenges in, in particularly our rural areas. So we're exploring some other potential models of care with, with um, partners, CBO partners, maybe a hybrid approach where some of the staff are uh, live in the field and some are virtual, things like that that we're, we're exploring. But uh, I think being flexible, you know, listening to our partners um, and, and understanding what some of their challenges and barriers are and then doing what we can as a health plan within the regulations of the program to, to help address some of those concerns. And Kelly, you did an amazing job, uh, sort of, you know, encapsulating what uh, you know your advice and or your comfort level with breaking the system. Um, uh, would you like to add maybe you know one or two sentences on on what you would recommend for for health plans? Well, I'm going to give my two minutes to Milo because I think it's probably the best to hear from the provider on what we could do. Thank you. You saw me unmute there. I was excited to speak to this. Uh, this is my, my request. I've been doing this for many years in different capacities. As you roll this out, just please keep it over the counter, keep it simple, keep it reliable. I think when you're rolling out a new program inside an agency, it's common instinct when something's new or uncertain to add controls, more levels, cross checks. Let's have one more audit. Let's uh, a little more, a little more controls and then to make sure it rolls out correctly. That will kill it. That will, that will really stop it. You can't serve this population and homelessness if you can't scale up and bring more providers. And I've just I've seen enough health network data and things to know that we're just such a small piece of your numbers. Uh, you know, I, I really think um, you know to have the mindset roll it out, keep it simple, plug and play, and then do an autopsy analysis. Okay, eight, uh, it's, uh, the year ended. Now it's month eighteen. Let's break it down and see how it went. I'll tell you right now, you're not going to find many issues except trouble ramping up your capacity. And so I just, I just really ask you to just keep it real simple. And uh, um, that, that empowers us to step up and hire and focus on what we just heard about staffing issues and quality control, making sure we have compassion combined with you know, qualified social workers and nurse practitioners. So this is my request. Thank you. Yeah. Love that. I couldn't have said it better myself. So there you go. <laughs> keep it simple, keep it simple. Melora, would you um, share any thoughts with, with folks given all your um, explorations? Uh, no, just uh, really appreciate folks sharing their experiences and their willingness to break the rules and try things. And, um, you know, that's what we need to do to make these partnerships work. 
Well, with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, the slides will be available. We have a number of resources on uh, chcs.org as well as chcf.org. I encourage you to look at them. Um, after this session, a survey will pop up. We would love to hear more from you. Um, and we have all your questions. So we'll definitely um, look at those and see uh, what we can do to amplify those themes moving forward. All right, with that, thank you and have a great day.